Every day, millions of Americans drive on highways without a second thought. They switch lanes, pass other vehicles, and trust their roads to keep them safe. But while American highways may look safe, they aren't the gold standard. Europe is home to some of the safest highways in the world. And they're not just better, they're over 200% better at keeping drivers safe. That's not an accident, that's engineering. But here's the strange part. European roads are often much narrower than those in the US, with some even allowing drivers to drive at speeds no American would think safe. So how is that possible? And what makes European highways so uniquely safe? To answer that, we need to look at where it all started. After World War II, the US entered a period of rapid growth. Highways stretched across the country and car ownership became a central part of American life. However, across the Atlantic, the picture was very different. European cities had been devastated by war. Bomb craters tore through roads and entire transport networks were left in ruins. But beneath the ruins was a rare opportunity. With so much already wiped out, Europe had the opportunity to rebuild, not just what was lost, but what had long been broken. Before the war, many roads were tight and inconsistent. They were also shared by cars, trams, and pedestrians, resulting in collisions, which often turned deadly. And by the late 1930s, the problem had reached a breaking point. Britain alone recorded over 8,000 road deaths in a single year, its highest on record. Now faced with a blank slate, countries had the chance to design something better. And they did. Sweden was the first to establish a national road safety board, and other countries soon followed. By the end of the 20th century, every major European nation had pulled ahead of the US in road safety. But the momentum didn't just stop there. Between 2001 and 2017, EU road deaths were slashed by more than half, making Europe the safest continent to drive in. All this progress didn't happen by chance. It came from doing things differently. So how exactly are European highways different from the US? And how do European roads continue to keep drivers safer than almost anywhere else? To understand that, we need to start with the most fundamental piece, road design. American roads are built for comfort. Lanes are wide, typically around 11 feet, and everything is designed to feel open. At first glance, that sounds like a good thing. But in reality, that comfort hides a deadly problem. You see, these wide lanes lower the tension behind the wheel. They make roads feel spacious and unthreatening, resulting in drivers speeding even without noticing. European engineers saw this pattern and made a simple yet genius redesign. Instead of making roads more spacious, they made them tighter. With many lanes measuring a modest 9 feet, that extra squeeze forces drivers to stay alert, leading to fewer high-speed crashes. But this raises a common question. If European roads are designed to slow drivers down, how come some don't even have speed limits? The answer lies in how they're built. High-speed stretches like the Autobahn aren't typical roads. They're engineered for control. Lanes are wider to give drivers more room to react, and curves are stretched out so steering stays subtle and stable, even at high speeds. But even with this, high speed still brings high risk. Fast-moving vehicles, all traveling in the same space, is a recipe for disaster. To combat this, the Autobahn has one simple rule. Keep right unless passing. It's simple, but powerful. By moving slower vehicles to the right and reserving the left for overtaking only, traffic becomes more predictable. And that predictability is what helps prevent collisions, even when cars are speeding down the road. Still, none of this works if the road isn't kept in perfect condition. Because at those speeds, even a small crack can turn into a serious hazard. In the US, road maintenance often focuses on short-term fixes. When cracks appear, they're patched. When potholes form, they're filled. Over time, these band-aid fixes turn into stitched together surfaces full of dips and gaps. In Europe, the mindset is different. Roads are treated as long-term infrastructure, with most built to survive decades of wear. Materials like stone mastic and porous asphalt do more than hold up. They drain water and resist erosion. And instead of waiting for damage, many countries build maintenance into the schedule from day one. And some countries go even further, in cities like Amsterdam, modular stone tiles replace traditional poured concrete. These tiles sit above a maze of buried utilities, fiber cables, and sewers. So when something breaks, workers lift the stones, fix the issue. No jackhammers, no patchwork. Just a road that puts itself back together. But pavement is just the foundation. Because in Europe, safety doesn't end with smooth roads. 
it starts with who those roads are built for. And more often than not, they're built for people first. In Europe, road design begins with a simple truth. People come first, not drivers, but cyclists and pedestrians. The entire system is shaped around protecting them, and nowhere is that more obvious than on a bike. Across most of the US, cycling isn't dangerous because of how people ride. It's dangerous because of how roads are built. Bike lanes are often just a stripe of paint pinned between moving traffic and turning cars, and they disappear right where the risk is highest, at intersections. That's where most crashes happen, and the consequences show up in the numbers. In 2010, the US recorded 4.7 cyclist deaths per 100 million kilometers traveled. The Netherlands recorded just 1.0. The difference isn't culture, it's geometry. The Dutch understood that risk decades ago and redesigned the intersection from the ground up. Instead of squeezing cyclists into traffic at the most dangerous point, they kept them fully separated all the way to the junction. To make that possible, engineers extended the corner curb just slightly, using the existing curve to create space for a small traffic island. That one shift allows the bike path to continue straight through the intersection without needing extra room. From there, visual cues make everything clear. A red surface highlights the bike lane, painted lines mark the crossing point, and the pedestrian crosswalk shifts just behind the bike lane, giving each group their own safe space. Even drivers are repositioned. The stop line moves back a few feet, so turning cars can see cyclists directly ahead, not in their blind spot. That small change turns a dangerous glance over the shoulder into a clear line of sight. If they arrive at the junction together, both parties can respond safely. And even left turns, often the riskiest part, are simplified. Instead of cutting across traffic, cyclists follow a clear, two-part path around the corner. This isn't a special feature. It's standard design across Dutch cities, because the roads were built with people in mind. And that mindset doesn't stop with infrastructure. It shows up in the kind of drivers those roads are built to support. In the US, getting a license is quick, and in most cases, easy. With many taught by their parents, teens are cleared to drive after a short written test and a basic road exam. And once the test is passed, that's it. Full driving privileges. Across Europe, this process looks very different. Many countries set driving age at 18, and it's not cheap. The average cost ranges from $1,500 to $2,000, all while following a strict learning program. In Germany, for example, drivers must complete 14 hours of classroom instruction and 12 hours behind the wheel. And in countries like Croatia, the required time can stretch past 80 hours. A massive contrast to the US's minimal training. But even after earning a license, drivers are still under watch. If drivers get caught speeding or using their phones, they might have to start the entire process all over again. And while that might sound excessive to an American, the goal in Europe isn't to make things harder just for the sake of it. It's to build better drivers, helping keep roads safer for everyone who uses them. But even good habits need structure, and that's where rules, and how they're enforced, start to matter. In the US, traffic enforcement is inconsistent. Penalties vary from state to state, and even serious offenses often come with low fines or just a warning. That inconsistency makes consequences feel optional, and when enforcement depends on catching someone in the act, many drivers take the risk. Europe went with a different approach. Instead of relying on patrols and roadside stops, enforcement is built into the road system itself. Speed cameras and red light cameras track violations automatically. There's no debate, no delay, a fine shows up in your mailbox with photographic proof, and those fines hit harder. In Norway, using a phone behind the wheel can cost nearly 900 euro, and in France, drunk driving carries a penalty of up to 4,500 euro before you even step into a courtroom. Blood alcohol limits are lower too. In most European countries, the legal limit is 0.05%, but in the US, it's 0.08%, a full 60% higher. And the results aren't just better compliance, it's a culture where getting caught isn't a maybe, it's a matter of time. But not every solution is about punishment. Some are about removing the danger before it even starts. In Europe, roundabouts are the rule, not the exception. Countries like France and the UK use them as standard intersections, and the results speak for themselves. By forcing slower, more predictable traffic flow, roundabouts dramatically reduce crash fatalities by up to 90%. So if they're that effective, why hasn't the US embraced them? Well, they did. Early American traffic circles 
weren't built for safety, they were built for speed. Entry points were wide, lanes overlapped, and drivers often had to switch lanes inside the circle. Crashes were common, and the concept gained a bad reputation. But here's the thing, those weren't modern roundabouts. The design was entirely different, but that distinction was lost, and the stigma stuck. Culture didn't help either. Films turned roundabouts into jokes, driving tests barely mentioned them, and without training or familiarity, hesitation became the norm. Over time, engineers defaulted to what felt predictable, stoplights and straight intersections. But that mindset is starting to shift. In Carmel, Indiana, nearly every signalized intersection was replaced with a roundabout, leading to an 80% drop in injury crashes. The success didn't just reduce accidents, it changed minds. Today, more cities are making the switch, and with every new roundabout, the idea becomes less foreign and more familiar. But while roundabouts reshape how traffic moves, Europe does something else just as carefully. It pays attention to where that traffic moves through. In Europe, roads don't just move people, they move through history. Many still follow ancient Roman routes, weaving past medieval towns and centuries-old landmarks. Infrastructure isn't built in place of heritage, it's built around it, with history treated as a constraint, not a casualty. This isn't just good planning. It reflects how deeply heritage is woven into the culture. In fact, more than 80% of Europeans consider cultural preservation part of their national identity. So when new projects are proposed, planners don't just ask can it be built, they ask should it. That question shapes the entire process. Cultural impact assessments are routine, and when a project threatens something historically or spiritually significant, it's often rerouted or stopped altogether. That's exactly what happened in Romania. A Canadian mining company once proposed a gold mine in Rosio, Montana that would have destroyed ancient Roman tunnels beneath a historic village. The public responded immediately. Protests swept the country, and by 2021, the site was protected as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. The mine never happened. In the US, that kind of response is rare. Hawaii's H3 freeway was built straight through native Hawaiian land cutting across sacred valleys, burial grounds, and ancient temples. For many, it wasn't just a highway, it was a decision made without them, one that left their history displaced and their voices dismissed. Europe's approach isn't just more careful, it's more respectful. Because when infrastructure honors what came before, it builds more than roads, it builds trust. And that trust doesn't slow down innovation. In the same places that protect ancient streets, engineers are quietly building what comes next. Europe isn't just focused on making roads safer, it's also rethinking what roads can do. In the Netherlands, a pilot known as Sola Road began with a simple bike path outside Amsterdam, but beneath the surface, photovoltaic panels quietly generated electricity, enough to power streetlights and traffic signals. The panels are skid resistant and built to withstand daily traffic. After early success, the project expanded into new pilots across the Netherlands and France. While one project works with sunlight, another tackles a different challenge, maintenance. The EU-funded Omicron project is developing robotic platforms that automate high-risk road work. These machines can seal cracks or remove lane markings with laser precision. Operators control them remotely through augmented or virtual reality, staying safely away from live traffic. With quicker repairs and fewer road closures, the benefits are already being put to work. The technology has passed field tests and is being written into European standards. But no matter what roads look like in the future, engineers will keep asking the same question. How can we make modern roads even safer? In the last hundred years, European roads have gone from being among the most dangerous to becoming the safest in the world. But sometimes, safety isn't just about how a road is built, it's about what happens when things go wrong. That's where road barriers come in. These simple looking structures are built to absorb massive impacts and redirect vehicles during a crash, keeping drivers and passengers safe. So how exactly do they do that? And what makes them so effective? Click here to find out.